plant, same as some Fuga. I really like that name. They wanted to clump it together with another plant. They said, oh, it's not really that different. I'm gonna, we're just going to shove it together with this other plant. I didn't like that idea. I said, I can't believe they're doing this. And he looked right at me and he said, there is no they. Wow. Yeah. Okay, I can do that. I can live that. And it's the same thing. We, we, can, we can name any plant Ugg if we want. And then we'll all know who Ugg is and we talk about Ugg and everything. And you know, it'd be good if one of us at least knew this language that I'm about to share with you. So, but if we all can at least talk it in the basic ways, then, like I said, the purpose of language is to be able to communicate, hopefully. So, when um, in the 1700s, this guy Linnaeus came along and he said instead of, you know, every time before the 1700s, people kind of named plants in relationship to being a human. Oh yeah, the one that tastes bitter, the one that's over the hill, the one that's by that creek that I like to have, or whatever. And so, when this guy Linnaeus came on, he said, let's name plants unto themselves. And he looked at the flower. And a flower it comes in a certain regular pattern. The outer part of the flower is called your sepals. And then inside from there are your petals. And then inside of there are your stamen. And in the very middle is your pistil, or your group of pistils. So that's, a, that's called a perfect flower. Not every flower has to have all that, but that's a perfect flower. And so what this guy Linnaeus did is he counted how many stamen a, a flower had. And just put it in a category. Oh, you have six and you have seven. But he went a little further. He said, oh, you have seven. But he looked at all the ones with seven and said, oh, this one has a little club shape. Or this one is, has a certain color. And he put them in subgroups, you know. And he looked at 5,000 plants that way. Back in the 1700s, pretty remarkable. He had people send in plants from all over the world when they were on cruises and looked at about 5,000 plants and created this thing called the binomial system. And so plants were named unto themselves. But what they did with plants is they flipped the name around. Like if I was a plant, I'd be Cook Frank. And so they, do, they just do little tricks like that so we get intimidated and we say, oh, we have to pay lots of money to have an expert come in and, and tell us about things. So I realized a lot of it's really simple. This is really simple stuff. Um, but this is what was used initially to, to, break, to divide and look at all the plants in the world. And uh, from him, other people went on and used the whole flower, you know, the pistols and the petals and the stamen, and used those as part of the indicators. And then came Darwin, Darwin came along, and Darwin said, hey, what about evolution? What about where plants grow, ecosystems, how they grow together and how they interface? So that became a factor in how we name things. And then after that, um, the chemists, you know, not after that, but at that same time, the chemists were blending things up and saying, wow, chemicals evolve too. And they don't just randomly show up in plants, they evolve in families of plants. So we started looking at chemistry, and then the last, what, 15 years, we've been looking at, uh, uh, you know, the whole genetics. And so the, geneticists, the geneticists have come in and said, hey, wait a minute, you think this is all one family? Well, look at it. When we look at it genetically, these are really not related. You know? and, and so they're having to rethink and every five years they get together and rename things and argue over this or that. So science is not any truthful thing that everybody's agreed to or anything like that. That's one of the hard things that we need to accept, that it's just as much a, a um, political and interactive playground as anything else. So this, this basic idea helps us to see that in the world of plants, there's, um, in the whole world, there's 325,000 species of plants. How many species of humans? Important one. Just one. Right, we seem to forget that. We sort of think it's, we're the only one. I think so we get back to that. But these 325,000 species of plants, um, they think there's another 10% that we haven't found yet. There's like 49 hotspots around the world that people are looking you know, for more, for more species. Actually, down in uh, Arkansas, I was there last year, there's a guy who's finding new species up in these serpentine areas that he's using, uh, like he was using GPS and different kind of things to like zone out likely areas where there would be these anomalies, you know, dry ridges or whatever you could think about where it would be like where caves were and stuff. And he goes there and looks and finds a distinction that's enough to make it a new species. So pretty cool thing. Some people are into that. I, I, I like the idea of, of that. That sounds fun. So there's 325,000 species. Um, they're clumped together into what we call the genus. Species means specific, genus means generic. So there's about 5,000 clumps of all these plants of the world that are together. And that's the part that I'm the most interested in, is the genus level, 5,000 groupings. 
but the part that I think appeal should appeal to all humans is the is the next level up, which is families. And uh, you've already heard us mention some families of plants, but there's about 500 families of plants. So the 325,000 species, which is in 5,000 genera, is grouped into 500 families. And I kind of think that that's really part about being a human, that you should, should at least know the families that are around you. And um, here in here in Tennessee, there's probably 200 families of plants, 200 out of the 500 of the world. Are here, why not make that like a goal for the next year or two to try to go meet? And, you know, it'd be really easy at first. Like today, if you really work, worked at it, you could find 30 or 40 families walking around if you really focused on it. Uh, we'll probably see 15 or 20, I imagine. So pay attention to the families. I'll try to say any plant that I'm pointing out the family name. And then beyond that, you can, if you're into it already, you can listen to the genus. And I'm not really a species person, so you have to ask Patrick and other people around here who are, because I, my brain would blow up. If I've traveled so much, I wouldn't be able to hold on that. But I have a lot to say at the genus level and the family level. So that's what you'll hear my, my input mostly. Um, and uh, yeah, so if you listen for that, that'll be, there's a whole lot more to that. But that's a good little introduction, I think. So this is an important plan. I didn't pick any of these that we put in the tea this morning just to have a conversation, you know. This plan is essential for right now. Uh, two reasons. One is that uh, both, as those, it seems like many of you know Patrick, and one of his areas of expertise and that a lot of people uh, uh, find a great uh, contribution to our culture is fermentation. And so this is a key plant for fermentation. We have to get off the regular consumption of hops. I feel like it's a, an important medicine at certain times. What's it, what's it an important medicine for? Sedative. Right, for putting you to sleep if you can't sleep and you, you're uh, restless. To use all the time would be... And that, it's almost like there should be two tiers, like the food of life that we need to be strong and then all the luxuries of life, you know, which are fun too. I mean, and I, you know, I love farmers, I love farming, but I think we're oppressing them. We have this new revolution of organic farms. We sent out the youth, the energized. And we're, I think we're just, I think once again, I think we're using them. I, I feel like if we just took care of our basic needs from the weeds and the things that we planted around us, that would take care of the basics. And then you could go to the farmer for the wines and the grapes and the fruits and you know, some of the luxury things that, you know, cheeses and whatever you're into, vinegars. And um, and have that be more of the commerce at the level. It would give those farmers, instead of working 70 hours a week, you know, get them back down to a reasonable amount of time to be putting their hands in the soil and let them have these other aspects of their lives and maybe pay them, you know, more reasonable, have a life, you know. So that's what I feel about farming myself. And I think getting to know, so the grasses, getting back to these guys, one of the biggest families in the world, right? The third, I really hope that whenever I talk, talk about grass, I'm always hoping I'm inspiring, you know, one or two people to get off on grasses and really learn them so that when we come together, they can go, oh, this is this, this is this, is that we'd all grow so fast, you know. Um, but remember, there's three kinds of grasses. There's grasses that grow in spikes like this. There's grasses that grow out like antennae. And they just have like three or four antennae that go out. And then there's grasses that panicle out and just push up and like, like, like pompous grass would be an <coughs> extreme example of that. But there's little ones that do that too. If we just looked around for a minute, we'd, we'd see all three. Right. as you're walking but that's how you can divide the world and say oh how many in your land i'm not expecting you to know all your grasses in the next year or two give yourself three to five years to really get down the plants around you and the grasses will be one of the ones you keep putting off and the mustards you'll keep putting off and the dycs the darn yellow composites you'll keep putting because they're just out there and they're, they're kind of overwhelming you know and you should put the umbels you know back a little bit and just start noting how so on your land go out and just note how many grasses you see and put them into those three categories. Oh, I see three with spikes. I see four that are panicles. And begin that thinking. Then when people come along, like if I came along, maybe I could name six of those plants, those, those grasses for you. And if you're lucky, someone who's really into grasses would come and knock them all out for you in just a day. And then once you know them, you can go backwards into understanding grasses and get to know them better. But they're, they're big. You know, there's probably uh, 16,000 grasses in the world. There's probably, in this state, of Tennessee, I wouldn't be surprised if there wasn't 300, 400 species of grasses. So that's a lot of work right there. But it's exciting because it's one of our most important foods. I mean, in the northern hemisphere, it's grasses. In the southern hemisphere, or the central tropical zones, it's palms are the main food staples. So, like, what do we eat in this family? Wheat. 
Wheat, yeah. 